ultimately what it is, it's a, it's a process of going inside and questioning every value that you hold and starting to understand that what you see in the projected world is a reflection of the concepts that are held. And, you know, there are stories throughout history, when you think of Siddhartha, that was kind of an extreme example of what you're talking about, where he's to leave the palace, leave the riches, and leave his wife, who's pregnant, just ready to give birth. That would be kind of more the extreme of, of what they would say, the abandoning father syndrome. <laughs> go on the night that your wife is giving birth to go off on your enlightenment journey, but that's an extreme example of it. It's a loosening in the mind of concepts. So, just like in this world, there are people like Tolstoy who have tried to, he tried to give away all of his possessions you know, he, he felt so bad about the poor in Russia that he gave away all his possessions, and he still felt terrible. He just didn't have any possessions that he, he gave away. He didn't, he didn't release, relinquish completely the idea of possession. It was seeing the possession in a projected world and then trying to divest stuff and things. And, and if you try to divest and walk away from things, even if the ego set things up, which the ego set the whole world up, and it sets up all kinds of duties and obligations and responsibilities in its world of lack, it's a projection of it, that, that really it's an inner job. You have to go through all the, the cleaning and the clearing away of all the false concepts and the false identity associations in the mind. And when you try to do it just in terms of form, like leave something behind in form, it generally shows up again in the next form, in the next form. If you, you know, you're in a relationship with an alcoholic, I've heard so many stories as I've traveled around the, the world, you know, where people say, I, I was married to an alcoholic, and I said, I can't do this anymore, so I got a divorce. Then I attracted another alcoholic <laughs> into my life, and married, I said, how did I, then a divorce again, and a third time, and a fourth time. How did I do this? How do I end up attracting like four alcoholics and marrying four alcoholics? It's because, you know, when you try to leave a problem in the form sense, and you're trying to just tinker with the effects, we'll say, the projected world, that doesn't bring any healing whatsoever. When you go inside and you start to really realize that, that the world is an outward picture of an inward condition, the world is literally projected beliefs and that that when you do change your beliefs and you disidentify from those beliefs and those concepts and categories then actually the world that you see will change significantly to a unified perception of the world because your judgments and your categories have gone in consciousness so what you're describing is is relatively rare it's actually uh, it's a calling in a sense that um, when Jesus said, I'm calling you out of the world, he was really saying, I'm calling you out of the belief system of the world. He's not calling you to live in a cave or, you know, live in the woods or anything. I'm calling you out of a belief system. And all of the false identity attachments and associations are part of the guilt. For example, let's use the, the father concept. Like you were talking about the bond between the father and the son. The father concept is a, is a concept of the ego. God doesn't create fathers and mothers. God doesn't create sons and daughters, nieces, nephews, aunts and uncles. God doesn't create lawyers and carpenters and accountants and so on and so forth. It's, it's the ego's world. It's, it's a projected world of false concepts. And it's not like you just go, oh, it's a false concept, so that's good, I'll just... I'll stop being that, you, you know, there's a, there's a strong investment in this egoic self-concept as a replacement for the Christ, as a replacement for the, the truth. And it takes a lot of mind training and practice and really guidance of being, following your guidance and slowly loosening and loosening and being unwound from this, these false self-concepts. And the Holy Spirit doesn't do like the magic trick where the, the whole tablecloth is just yanked away. This can happen, and it does happen very rarely, but actually 
for most, they're given more of a slowly evolving curriculum where they begin to question and loosen those identifications. Like I had people who followed me back in the 1990s and for them, you know, the idea of leaving their children behind, you know, was just unthinkable, absolutely unthinkable. But even when they would go with me on a road trip, you know, that was a big deal. It wasn't like leaving them behind for good. It was just like leaving them behind for three days. That was a major, that was a major thing. They would have a lot of trepidation and fear around even doing that. And then when we would travel and we would shine the light and we would let the Spirit pour through us, it was interesting how children would show up on the trip and they would have these wonderful, wonderful encounters with the children, even though they weren't seemingly their own children. It was like the Spirit saying, wonderful, you're not losing anything here. If you listen and follow to me, the Spirit say, there's no sacrifice. You're not going to leave anything real and true behind. You're just going to be led step by step into a loosening of the self-concepts. And those are the things, it doesn't even matter. I mean, I know, when we look at the research, like you were talking about the research uh, that's done on children of single parents versus, you know, families where both parents are present and so forth. Any kind of research that's based on the effects, based on the, the data, we'll say, of the, the world, you know, the, the empirical data of the world, whether it's Newtonian physics, which is entirely based on, on the data of the world, it's, it's based on the empirical method, that the scientific method is based on empiricism, collecting data to draw conclusions, now, when you start to get into the course in quantum physics, you see that it's all backwards, that you can never draw on the data and the empiricism of the world through the five senses to find out anything about the truth. Uh, the truth is entirely within, and everything, and even those cause-effect relationships in the scientific proof and so on and so forth, it seems to be very valid within that context, is all based on a false hypothesis. What is that hypothesis? That there's actually a world out there with real things happening apart from mind, apart from consciousness. Now with quantum physics, you know, basically the early quantum physicists who, who came along maybe about six decades ago and when they started, even the, the discoverer of the atom and Planck and a lot of the early scientists that started to really work with subatomic particles, they started to realize for the first time that atoms weren't things. Even though when we were in, in school, you know, they drew the nucleus and the little, the protons and electrons, you know, they made it look like things, you know, and so I could see it on the blackboard, it's a thing. And then the, the discoverer of the atom, you know, he says, no, atoms, atoms aren't things, they're potentials. Potentials? What's that? What's a potential? You know, it's like, is it there or not? You know, and, and you know, is it, all these waves and particles and all these deeper probings about what is the nature of everything and finding out that most of this, you know, most within atoms is space and most of the cosmos is just space. It's like uh, Einstein called it an optical delusion of consciousness. But when you go deeper and deeper inward down to the smaller and smaller particles and everything, and you, when they finally discovered that there was no world apart from thought, and they, they couldn't get the experimenter out of the experiment. Oh man, that just, that threw everything upside down. All these scientists for years believing, like Isaac Newton, that you could measure things, and you could learn through empirical evidence of the world. You know, you, once they started to realize that, that it was all subjective, that they, they couldn't get the experimenter out of the experiment. And even in the double-blind experiments that the consciousness of the experimenter was determining the outcome of the experiment, it just blew the whole scientific uh, equation out. Science is gone! Science is out of there! And all concepts of God and theology are out of there. You know, you start to realize, whoa, we have been mistaken royally about everything. And you start throwing theologies out, and you throw science out, and you realize that both are equally false, then you're going to get into diving into an experience. 
of what we could say true forgiveness or true, you know, the quantum field or, or unified awareness or whatever you want to call it. That's really great because then you can cut through so much stuff. But in the end, it's, it's the quality of life, we'll say, of what we would say parent-child relationships, it comes back to you, the quality of state of mind. And, and it comes deeper and deeper into this experience that as you experience joy and happiness, it has to be that that is the experience of the whole universe. Because there is no world apart from what you think. There is no universe that's out there as a separate existence apart from consciousness. And as soon as you're on to that, as soon as you get a, a glimmer of, of that being like a, uh, just the way things are, then you put your effort into forgiveness. You really put your effort into letting go of everything you think you think and think you know. and. And that would include let, letting go of all opinions. Uh, for me, I mean, I, I actually, I was a, I was a big follower of science. I was a fan. Uh, I have to say, you know, growing up in Christianity, I just felt like Christianity had so many holes in it. Uh, I said, man, <laughs> I don't know how people believe in this. It's <laughs> so hypocritical. And and I was looking at that theology, just going, it's really pathetic. Uh, and then. I got started getting into science and I thought, okay, here's a different road, I'm going to try that. And I really got into it. I was a big fan. And then, you know, but the deeper I went with it, I could see that there were these arguments and struggles going on between religion and science and things. And I thought, there's no harmony, so I don't really feel there's truth if there's no harmony. I think harmony and truth have to be the same. And so then I had to go much, much deeper and see the complete fallacy of, of Newtonian physics and science as we've known it, and the complete fallacy of theology, and then I was really ready to have, to open up to an experience. So, in answer to your question, it's, it's rare, but, but actually the deeper you go, it, it goes into that, that experience that Jesus talked about. Who is my father, mother, sister, brother? He that does the will of my father in heaven is my father, mother, sister, brother. The roles just start to be seen for what they are. They, they're part of a story. Uh, you can't really have a biological father and mother if you were created by God. Why? Because God is an eternal source and you must be like that eternal source. This planet and these roles are the most unlike that source that you could ever have. Uh, you know, I had trouble when I was in Christianity mem memorizing the statement of faith, the, the, it was called the Apostles' Creed. You know, to get confirmed in my Christian religion, I had to memorize and recite back this statement of faith that it starts off with God created the heavens and the earth. There's something in my soul that was like, that's just the beginning. I mean, I'm like, gotta be kidding. I just could not, I couldn't even memorize it. I couldn't even put it to memory because there's something in my soul that just was like regurgitating it <laughs> at some points. And I couldn't, I couldn't play the game. I couldn't go along and be the good little Christian boy and I just, I, I couldn't do it. So that's, that's ultimately where this goes and, and ultimately I'd say that it, it, once you come to a clarity of mind and see the nothingness of the world, in that clarity you also do see the nothingness of the concepts of the world. And, and in that you, you don't see that the concepts are good or bad, you just see that they're unreal. Uh, and, and there's a state of transcendence, of shining, and happiness, and joy, of friendliness. You know, you're friendly with, with everything and everyone. You know, you're not, you don't have to combat, you don't have to debate, there's no arguments. All those things, uh, no, no opinions, you know, it all just flow, like falls from you. And you're just left with that essence of love. So that's kind of a big answer to a, a very specific question. Thank you! You're welcome! <laughs>